Welcome to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas, brought to you by the Independent Institute. My show that brings a uniquely rational perspective to important issues facing society today. Today's guest is United States Senator Rand Paul, a physician, an MD, a graduate of Duke Medical School, and uh, where he later trained as an ophthalmologist, and now a senator from Kentucky since 2010. He's one of the nation's leading advocates for liberty. Elected in 2010, Senator Paul since then has been an outspoken champion for constitutional freedoms and fiscal responsibility, and most importantly these days, a fierce advocate against government overreach. Senator Paul and I are having a important discussion about what many consider to be the most egregious example of government overreach in modern history, the management of the SARS-2 COVID pandemic, and we'll talk about his quest to expose critical information about the pandemic and what Congress is doing or can do to restore objectivity and freedom in a free and ethical society. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. Okay, Senator Paul, welcome. Glad to be with you, Scott. Thanks for having me. Okay, thanks for uh, squeezing this in. We have a lot of topics to explore. You're the center of what really one of the very few elected leaders who is trying to open up the facts and add visibility, but ultimately accountability to the management of the pandemic, really what I consider the biggest fiasco in modern public health care and confidence, of course, in public health authorities has plummeted due to that management. So let's dive into the first topic, really, which is the COVID investigations that really you're spearheading particularly, but not only about the origin of the virus. You know, in the first year of the virus, I really wasn't as aware of a lot of the controversy. I thought that, you know, why would the scientists be dishonest with us if they said it came from animals? That's what happened when the first SARS virus came out in 2003. Surely they must just be telling us the truth. And then about a year later, I read an article by uh, Nicholas Wade. And in that article, he began talking about how COVID had uh, aspects to the genetic sequence that actually looked like it had been manipulated in the lab. But I became very curious as to this. But the more I came into information about this and the more people looked, the more they found that even the scientists, Fauci and his cohorts, also believed that it came from the lab in the beginning and that it was manipulated. But then they were publicly saying the opposite of what they were saying privately. And so, yeah, I've been thoroughly enmeshed in this for over two years now. I completely believe that it came from the lab in Wuhan. And I also do believe that uh, most of the leading uh, public health officers from Tony Fauci on down all thought it came from the lab too. And they were dishonest with the public and began covering it up, mainly because they had funded this research and there was a certain culpability that would attach to them because they had been funding this research that ultimately led to the pandemic. And so I think there was a cover up from day one. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really what the public needs to understand, not just that the origin uh, was either concealed or misappropriated, but the question of why. And that seems to be covering up malfeasance, because it's not just that Fauci and the NIH under Dr. Collins funded research in Wuhan, but the key is they funded research that was dangerous when it was banned in the United States. Yeah, not only was it banned, but... If there was going to be any exemptions to it, it had to get Tony Fauci's permission or Francis Collins' permission. But we also know that they had set up when the ban was over after 2016 and when they be early 2017, when they begin doing this research again, they say any dangerous research should go before this committee, this special safety committee called the P3CO committee. But it turns out that none of this research went before the committee. It either was done during the time when it should have been banned and was outsourced to China because they were just trying to hide it for some reason, or if it originated after the ban, didn't go before the safety committee. So I fully believe that there were laws broken, they were dishonest, they were deceitful, but they actually purposely went around. And I think ultimately we're going to find paperwork that has Anthony Fauci saying that this was not gain-of-function research. Well, we also have his private email from February of 2020 saying, looks like the virus is manipulated and we know to be worried and suspicious because we know they do gain of function research in that lab in Wuhan. 
So I think we have uh, all the evidence really we need that he's perjured himself in front of the committee to me saying there was no gain of function and that they didn't fund it. Um, so I think there is a day of reckoning. But for me, it's not just about Fauci's culpability. It's also about how do we prevent this from happening again? I'm thoroughly right. convinced it came from the lab, but I think we're still continuing to fund this kind of dangerous research, and I think it could happen again. I mean, the question here, you know, first of all, the accountability about the perjury. But like you're saying, the bigger issue is the accountability about funding research with U.S. taxpayer money uh, just to get around the rules. And I, I wonder, is that, uh, you know, just asking as a layman about this stuff, is that potentially a criminally indictable activity by the NIH? Or how does the accountability actually happen to the people who were directly involved? Lying to Congress is a felony. It can be punished with up to five years in prison. The problem is we now live in a society where the Department of Justice seems to only be used against certain people based on their philosophic beliefs. So during the Trump administration, people were accused of lying to Congress. The FBI snatched them out of bed at early in the morning and put them in jail. Now that we have people on the other side of the aisle accused of lying, nothing's happening. This Department of Justice is basically being run as a partisan sort of retribution probably for Mary Garland not getting on the Supreme Court. And that's what it's become. But I've sent the documentation. We have the documentation in his own words. We have him saying adamantly that he never funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan. But then we have him privately saying, yes, it's gain-of-function. And we also know he funded it because when we look at the research papers, as you know, in the paper, it will acknowledge their grant funding and it lists grants from Tony Fauci. It lists the NIAID number that they got from right. getting the money. So he's dead to rights on this. He's admitted it was gain of function. And yet there is no um, there is no rec day of reckoning because the Department of Justice refuses to prosecute him. Right. It all hinges on the actual enforcement of the breaking of, the, of these laws by the DOJ. What about ensuring the accountability in sort of a broader sense about other things, including financial impropriety. I think it's it's sort of shocking if the public would really understand that people in the CDC, the NIH, and the FDA share in royalties for drugs that they are in charge of approving and disapproving competitors, potentially. Is there a way that Congress, we don't even have full disclosure, the NIH does not re uh, reveal the details of, say, for instance, Dr. Fauci's sharing of royalties. What is Congress doing or what can they do to force sort of full disclosure and eliminate those royalty sharing conflicts? Well, I asked Tony Fauci this directly in committee. Did anybody on the committees that approved the vaccines actually receive royalties from the companies that manufacture the vaccines? This should be the basics of conflict of interest that should be revealed. And he basically told me it was none of my business, which by extension means that he believed it's none of the public's business. Open records and FOIA requests have gone in, and we have discovered that it's not an insignificant amount of people. Thousands of NIH researchers have received millions of dollars. I think one tally was 3,000 scientists, $193 million. But they will not reveal which scientists got the money, how much, and right. from whom. And so I've asked directly, you know, if you're on the committee approving of a vaccine, wouldn't you have to reveal if you got royalties from Pfizer, who manufactures the vaccine, or Moderna? And they won't reveal this. They point to a law from the 1980s, the Birch Dole Law. But my staff has read that law, and their interpretation of the law is there is no restriction. But we're at an impasse. Without a Department of Justice that will do anything, without Democrats and well, You have to realize, I've been trying for three years to get non-classified records of NIH grants revealed to me by my own government. And they've refused steadfastly, and Democrats have refused to step up to sign letters. After two years and after stopping dozens and dozens of personal requests by the Democrat chairman, I've finally gotten a couple of those letters signed and a few things revealed. But I have two 250-page uh, discussions of coronavirus and research and implications of the potential lab leak that's all completely redacted. I have another a document that's 255 pages long that is also completely redacted. If I had it in front of me, I'd flip through and every page is wiped out. This is not classified information. It's not even classified in any way. Congress passed a law because they finally sensed my frustration with this. We passed a law unanimously in the Senate 
unanimously in the House to tell the Biden administration to declassify it all. But it's worse than that. It's not, they won't give us the unclassified stuff already. It's the shocking, main, really, the, but... most, the most important grant that we learned about only came to us from a whistleblower. This is from 2018. It's a grant called the Diffuse Grant. And it was money that Wuhan Lab and a scientist in North Carolina and this guy named Peter Dayzak all came together. They wanted money to stick a furin cleavage site into a coronavirus. A furin cleavage site is what helps the virus to get into human cells. It enhances sure. human infectivity. It's unusual and really has never been found in this particular category of coronaviruses in nature. So when people discovered this, including Fauci and all his cronies, I was like, holy, you know what? We can't believe it. This looks like it may have been inserted. Well, we found that Wuhan Lab and the scientists from North Carolina, Peter Dayzak, had asked for money to do this in 2018. But you know the only reason we found this out? The doctor in North Carolina didn't tell us. Peter Dayzak didn't tell us. Anthony Fauci didn't tell us. A whistleblower at DARPA, which is a secretive agency within our Defense Department, told us, or we would have not known that. So what I've been doing is searching through all these other grants, trying to find something like this, but it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And if they withhold one grant that has it, how will I know? Because I'm looking through thousands of these, trying to find another. So we really do need more whistleblowers, but uh, there's been, everything has been about hiding the ball. Nobody's been forthcoming yeah. in this, and really people should go to prison over this. I mean, we really need a way to have some accountability here because there's zero accountability to the public. These people work for us. They're not just using taxpayer money. They're endangering the public. I want to talk uh, before you go about reforms that are possible to limit the power of these people that are really bureaucrats and agency people. I mean, first of all, declaring a, and even elected officials declaring a public health emergency without defining an emergency or having any limitation on the duration of such emergency. Is there a way to have that kind of power curtailed in, in a law in legislative action or things like limiting terms of bureaucrats that run these agencies, uh, you know, transparency to the public of the meetings themselves. So we've introduced legislation to make Anthony Fauci's position uh, to divide it into three places. And so there'd be an infectious disease person, an allergy, and, and an immunology person. It'd be three different uh, positions to have them term limited to, uh, I think it's two four-year terms, eight years, and then to have it be approved by the Senate. To involve some oversight in this. I did get a vote on it in committee and lost to all, no Democrats voted for it and I lost several Republicans on it. But that would be one way of having oversight over this would be yeah. to make it a Senate approved position and divide it. We've also looked at the emergency powers and emergency powers, you know, the, the, the courts have said you don't throw out the Constitution during emergencies, but a lot of our legislation acts as if you could throw things away. So when the CDC, and this actually happened somewhat of the Trump administration, they decided that there was a CDC law from the 1930s that said you should do this and this for certain diseases, quarantine, and then it had a clause in there and whatever else is necessary. The Trump administration used that to say we didn't have to pay our mortgages. And then the Biden administration continued that on. But this is a power that in no way was ever given to the CDC. No one ever anticipated the CDC would say you don't have to pay your mortgage anymore, or pay your rent, or pay your car payment. That is crazy. We also have another series of emergency powers. Some of them have been on, though. We've had, like, some emergencies have been going on 50 years. They're still on the books. There's actually an emergency power that was given to the FCC in the 1930s that gives the president the power to shut down all communications and control all communications in the U.S. People call it the Internet kill switch. It's never been used. But And it predates the Internet, but people now think in applying it to the Internet that a president has the power to shut down the Internet. Nobody should have this. Look, I was a supporter of Trump. He shouldn't have it. I'm not a supporter of Biden. He definitely should have. No president of either party should have this kind of power. So we should get rid of these emergency powers. And I'm a sponsor of a bill to get rid of them as well. The one good thing that happened, like in our state of Kentucky, our governor used emergency power to close churches, restaurants, and all, et cetera hotels, gyms. The court shut him down, but when the legislature finally came back into power, they said his emergency powers don't last longer than 30 days. So if he would just shut down something like hotels, which I think you never should do, but if you do it, it only lasts 30 days and it expires unless the state legislature reaffirms it. 
we should do the same in Washington. It should be an automatic Absolutely. expiration. And most people thought emergency powers were like delivering blankets and water in a tornado. I'm fine with that kind of emergency power. But nobody ever thought you could close someone's business down for years at a time uh, during an emergency. And then to make matters worse, most of the things they did didn't work and weren't good science. Most of the mandates involved things that didn't slow the spread of the disease and really were uh, in error, even just based on the science, not based on the freedom Absolutely. that was lost, but just based on the science. Most things they did were ineffective and, and wrongheaded. Right. So, you know, this really like this to me, the emergency is the government power is out of control and they're breaking the constitutional rights that we have in a free society. I just want one final comment, if I can, on the World Health Organization. Where are we going with this organization that's been dreadfully incompetent, harmful to free societies, and now seemingly, uh, you know, composing a pandemic accord that will actually be legally enforceable? What's going on with that, and how do we stop this kind of lack of, of United States sovereignty over its own decisions? You know, we should never give any sovereignty to any international organization. It's basically saying that the Constitution doesn't matter and the responsiveness of representative government to its people doesn't exist, that somehow uh, people that were never elected would have a say over our basic freedoms. This was basically the primary fight we had against England. You know, we had taxation without representation. And now we yes. have mandates without representation. We didn't vote for anybody. Nobody in America votes for someone in the WHO or the UN. And you have to realize that while our country was bad in taking away freedoms, many countries were even worse. I mean, in China, they basically used the technology from the Middle Ages of sealing people into their homes. Uh, they, you saw the pictures of people with batons and you know, the white-suited right. hazmat people chasing people down in the street. But realize that was one step worse than what we had. But realize that in our country, the governor of California sent the Coast Guard after a guy paddleboarding by himself. There's one clip Absolutely. on the internet of a guy jogging on the beach by himself. You know, the, the thing is, is it's not just the, the terrible abrogation of freedom. There's no science behind that some guy jogging on the beach by himself is threatening anyone. There's not really Zero. any science that the disease is well spread outside at all. And really, shouldn't it be your choice? If you're, if you're older or you have a sickness, don't go to church and don't go to the movie theater, but let people make their own decisions based on their own risk factors. And this has really been the main problem. Everything about this goes against what medical science has always said. You individualize your treatment plan according to the individual's risks. And I tell audiences this all the time. If a 12-year-old comes into the emergency room with chest pain, you treat him differently than if a 60-year-old comes in with chest pain. You think of different things. You know, you think of asthma, you think of anxiety, yeah. and you think of a fall, but you don't immediately order heart enzymes on a 12-year-old with, with, with chest pain. And you're looking for other things. But a 60-year-old, you might immediately order heart enzymes to see if they're having a heart attack. But this blanket one-size-fits-all has really been destructive to medicine, this idea you can't use certain drugs. Everything they've done has really been a disservice, uh, and it, it precludes us from actually finding uh, perhaps new cures and new treatments for uh, assorted diseases if we don't let physicians have uh, the freedom to look for cures. Absolutely, particularly since everything about pandemic management was violated that was known for 15 years about how harmful, how ineffective these lockdowns were. I mean, we can go on and on about the harms. Uh, we'll probably try to have you back. Thanks for squeezing us in on this uh, busy day for you. Thank you, Senator Paul. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, the best way is to follow the news, keep tabs on his work, particularly spearheading the investigations into the COVID pandemic and his investigations of what looks to be malfeasance by our public health leaders, scandalously so. And don't forget to subscribe to this show on YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now, and I'll see you next time.